rivalry that can match the intensity, passion, and sheer Rust Belt glamour of Michigan, Ohio State. Hey, everybody. He's Bo. I'm Woody. No, that ain't it. He's Brady Hulk. I'm Irma Vile. That ain't it either. It's Ohio State, Michigan week, and this is also Vikings Report, Drew and Ted. Drewster, it's time. <laughs> Hail to the victors, valiant hail Stop it. to the Stop it. conquering I'm done. heroes. We're done. Hail, hail <laughs> to Michigan, we're gonna kick your ass. Yeah! No, you're not. No, you're not. Never missed a game since 1970. I missed one half of one game. The first half when I was uh, hungover about 25 <laughs> years ago, but I've never missed this game. And I know really? you never, you, you only miss it because of military Military, and you have Archie Griffin. I got to give Archie Griffin behind you. You got to give him a prop. So, yeah, only two time winner in college football history, Archie Griffin, the greatness that he was, Ohio State legend. I got my picture taken with Archie Griffin. Did you know that? Did you really? Yeah. So, like in 2006, when Ohio State played Florida for the national championship and they got absolutely spanked, I actually went to the game yep. and we're walking down the concourse there at the Cardinal Stadium, whatever it's called. And Archie Griffin's walking by, and me and the buddy I'm with, hey, that's, hey, Archie. And he turns around. <laughs> hey, can we get a quick picture? Yeah, got to be quick, guys. But I'm, I'm in a hurry. But, yeah, I got, I got time for a quick picture. So I got my picture taken with Archie Griffin. It was pretty cool. I got my picture taken with Merv Griffin. Not quite as good, but. <laughs> yeah, but that was like your bug shots, though, wasn't it? After you guys had gone out drinking, you and Merv Griffin? <laughs> And Mike Douglas. He Mike was there too. Douglas. <laughs> the town drunk. It's a lot different than the game we grew up watching. I mean, last yeah. year there was over a thousand yards of offense last year yeah. in the Michigan Ohio State game. Yep. And it took you could watch eight games in the seventies and it wouldn't total a thousand yards total. No, uh -uh. It's a lot different now, but it still has the power. Both teams ran the triple option. Now that Michigan's back in the, the rivalry, it makes it, you know, with the last two wins, the last two years, it makes it more feel more Rivalrific. You know, we'll talk about all that later on. We're going to do a, a quick, kind of an abbreviated preview of the Ohio State Michigan game because obviously I'm a big Ohio State fan, just a big Michigan fan. We will talk about all that here in a little bit. We've got some other things to talk about. Ruby's in the background. So we want to at least say hi and, and say thanks for everything you do, Ruby, for making this show go. Also, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. I hope you all had a, a great Thanksgiving. We are recording before Thanksgiving, but by the time you see this, it will be after the holiday. I hope you all had a fun and enjoyable time with your family. And the crazy uncle that talked politics ended up in a fist fight and got arrested. I don't know. I mean, I mean this just kind of happens in about one of every three families, it sounds like. I don't know. You're up there with the baked beans. I don't do the baked beans. I'm... You're never going to let that go like the time the Ohio State and Michigan tied and the athletic directors voted for Ohio State to go to the Rose Bowl, <laughs> not Michigan. <laughs> 15-point win two years ago and a 22-point win last year. You guys better get it together, Ted. Man, this is the, the least confident I have felt going into an Ohio State-Michigan game in a very long time. Very long time. I was time really long. confident until that Michigan game last week. Yeah, and I, and I, I kinda, I, I'm kind of <laughs> building up some hope. Yeah, we'll talk about this here a little bit. Anyways, we got a lot we do have to talk about. This is a Vikings report with Drew and Ted, not the Ohio State-Michigan report. As always, we want to say uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Thanks for joining us. We've got our typical contests going on. We'll talk about those in a minute. But we also want to talk to you about Purple Pain Forms and VikingsReport.com. Purple Pain Forms is our home on the Internet. You can find our show there. You can find me, Drew, and Ruby commenting there. Uh, it's a great message board full of great fans talking all things Vikings. None of the garbage and the insults and all that stuff that you just hate on social media. Just a smart bunch of Vikings folks and uh, really enjoyable place to go and talk not only Vikings but football you want to talk college football upcoming draft picks quarterbacks that's a that's a topic of conversation got some great original content with Dan Shad who was on our show a few weeks ago before the Falcons game just great loads of information and commentary from those fine folks over at purplepainforms.com so go over there sign up for an account start commenting today the other place is vikingsreport.com our little corner of the internet where you can find our prize vault there. You can find our nobody cares about your fantasy picks. And if you win a prize, you, that's where you can find our prize vault and all that good stuff. Ruby's done a great job with that site, getting it ready to go. And uh, just a couple of great places to go hang out.
we have our, our season-long Nobody Cares About Your Fantasy Team contest. We'll get the picks, and, and we'll talk our little smack about that here in a little bit. But the other contest we're running is our Defend the North contest, and we've got week three of our Defend the North. And, and we won't have another Defend the North contest, but then at the end of the year, we will have three back-to-back-to-back as the Vikings play Detroit, Chicago, and then Detroit again to wrap the season up. So this will be our last Defend the North contest for a while. And for our Defend the North contest, it's very simple. All you need to do is pick who you think is going to win the game between Chicago and Minnesota on Monday night, and then pick a score. Vikings 24-21, Bears 17-14, whatever. So to be eligible to win, you have to pick the correct team who wins the game, and then you have to be closest in total points. If you go over, under, it doesn't matter. It's just who is ever closest in total points. You do that, and you win. What do you win, Drew? It's a pretty cool shirt, I think. You win the Defend the North t-shirt, which I have handy here. Oh, also, there's a Michigan helmet behind me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I noticed. <laughs> you win this t-shirt, Ted. Yeah. Uh, that is a Tunsis designed t-shirt, by the way. Right. Defend the North has tombstones with all the other teams. Tunsis did a great job designing that. And that's what we give out to the winner. Again, all you got to do, if you pick the winning team correctly, then whoever has the closest combined score wins the t-shirt. And if there's a tie, then tie goes to the Buckeye fan. So... <laughs> There you go. Speaking of defending the North, we're not doing a very good job of it this year, are we? <laughs> no. They need to start defending it a little better, Ted. Yeah. Yeah. So we're kind of hurrying a little bit this week, so we're not going to do any news. We're going we're gonna to roll everything into our preview segment here in a little bit. So we're going to move on right directly to nobody got the best fantasy team. their winning ways or will they be eaten by the bears we'll find out all right as always we're gonna slide off to the side here ruby is gonna put up our vikings report big board our homage to cbs today from back in the day with Jimmy the greek snyder brent musburger irv cross and phyllis george the best pregame show there ever was and as always we will start with quarterback, and we will finish with intangibles. What are those? One more time, what are those? It's, it's just stuff you can't see, son. Just okay. shut up and watch the show. Okay. <laughs> what do you got for quarterback, Ted? I'm interested to see who you're going to pick here. You know, th- this one I, I had to think about a little bit. You know, everybody's saying, well, it's Josh Dobbs. He had two very good games for the Vikings. Yeah. The first one against Atlanta it really came out of nowhere. The second one I arguably might have been his career best game. He sort of came back to earth uh, on Sunday night against the Broncos. Had a had a couple of fumbles, had the interception, uh, looked a little bit more indecisive than he was earlier. Contrast that with Justin Fields, who started off really poorly this season. And right when he was finding his groove, he got hurt, ironically enough, against the Vikings. He hurt his thumb, was out of a few games. And he's back, and he, he played a, a fairly decent game, I think, last week. A lot of people say Josh Dobbs is like a poor man's Justin Fields. You look at their numbers, right? and if you were to take Dobbs' numbers and kind of extrapolate them to the same amount of games Justin Fields has played, they're about identical, man. They're very close. The, the thing that worries me about Dobbs is the turnover bug feels like it's coming back. He had three fumbles his first game, none against the Saints. He had three fumbles last week and the interception. If he can avoid turning the ball over or fumbling it, I would. I think I would pick Josh Dobbs. I think, however, I'm going to take Justin Fields by just like it, just a very, 
very, very slight margin. And it's and it's because of the turnover thing that has me worried about Dobbs. And it has it has absolutely nothing to do with the school Justin Fields went to. It's purely unemotional in this evaluation. Shocker. I'm giving it to Fields, which also has nothing to do with how I feel about Ohio State. <laughs> Just ever so slightly. I went back and forth on it, and I thought, you know, I'm right in the boat with you about the turnovers. I think Fields is just a little more skilled at the quarterback position. Pure passing, maybe a little bit more accurate, maybe a little better at running defense, noticing what defensive alignments are coming at him. But they're both very similar how they run an offense. They both Mm -hmm. get out of trouble. They both can make plays on the run. They both can pick up first downs with their feet. So after that week six game, I actually think the Vikings got a better shot at getting yardage with Josh Dobbs than they do with Kirk Cousins. We can go okay. over that a little bit later because you look at the week six statistics against the Bears at Soldier Field, it was not good for the Vikings. The passing game was not good. I think he can make more plays with his feet, but as a pure quarterback, I think Fields is just a little better. So I had to give him my check mark. Okay. Running game, Drew. How, how do you see that? Well, the first time we met in week six, the Bears had 162 on the ground. When uh, Fields got hurt, we had 46. That cannot happen. The Bears run the football very well. I think this season they've only had two games under 100 yards as a team rushing. They're a really good rushing team, Ted. They don't have the big top names, but they're good collectively as a group. I think Deontay Foreman got hurt last week against Detroit. He has an ankle injury. I'm not sure he's listed as questionable, but if they don't don't have him, they're pretty much down to what? The other, what's that guy, Herbert? Khalil Herbert and Rashawn Johnson. Right. But they are the fourth best rushing team in the NFL. Yeah. The fourth best rushing team without really a big name. I'm not sold on the Vikings. Alexander Madison has 21 rushes in the red zone for 23 yards. But yet we keep going to that play. Yeah. Bears have a pretty good run defense as well. They're second in football. So you combine their run defense with the Vikings. I had to give the check mark to the Bears. I am too. Like you said, the Bears have the fourth best running attack in the NFL. It doesn't matter who they have. Khalil Herbert was their starter coming in this season, but he got hurt. Dante Foreman came in, played very well. Rashawn Johnson has has played well when he's in, when he's been in there. And then, of course, you have to take into consideration the, the running ability of Justin Fields. I thought the Vikings found something against the Broncos, but the Broncos were one of the worst rushing teams in the NFL going into that game. I like the running ability. Dobbs gives the running game for the Vikings, but you know, when you have fields on the other side, that sort of negates that. Those two cancel each other out, I think, to a great extent. I'm going to have to give it to the Bears as well. The receiving game, however, I like the Vikings here a lot. You look at the Bears' pass defense, they're they're close to the bottom in the NFL. They're 26. They're giving up, what, 245 yards a game through the air. Right. You've got Jordan Addison, who I think needs to get more involved this week. I, he was fairly quiet last week. TJ Hawkinson is the number one receiving tight end in the NFL with 75 catches, 736 yeah. yards. You got to get rid of him, though, remember? Yeah, yeah, I remember when he was an overpaid, overrated bum, and they should have <laughs> traded him. I, I guess they still should. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> oh, East Hat Nation, we love you. The big question is Justin Jefferson going to be back. He came off the IR, and he had this 21-day window to be activated to the roster or he would miss the rest of the season. I think the Vikings have to activate him this week. That 21 day window will expire. If they do, I don't see him playing. I think they will give him with the Vikings by coming up after this game. I think they will give him that extra week of rest just to double check or double doubly ensure this hamstring will be healthy going into the final home stretch of the season. With that said, the Vikings have played very well without Justin Jefferson. So they should probably trade him as well. Um, oh, absolutely get rid of him. And K.J. Osborne's back, so I, I'd like to see him get involved a little bit more. I mean, you look at the Bears, D.J. Moore is the best. Without Justin Jefferson, I think D.J. Moore is the best receiver on the field, but I'm not sold on Darnell Mooney. Equinemania St. Brown was one of their free agent signings. I think he's got all of like four or five catches. Cole Komet Terrible. is is kind of okay as a tight end. He's got almost 50 catches, but collectively, even with Justin Jefferson out, I like the Vikings receiving game here. I do too, Ted. I think Powell has been a go-to target. Hawkinson had a really good game at Soldier Field the first week six when we played him. I think they could beat him without JJ. I think they can because I think they're getting more comfortable with Dobbs. I'm probably going to pick their receiving game the rest of the way because I don't see a lot of teams that are going to outdo the Vikings as receivers. It just depends on the play calling. Which we'll get, we'll talk about that. The play calling and uh, 
the execution of some of these plays down in the red zone. Uh, yeah. DJ Moore, you certainly have to keep track of him. I mean, he's on the verge of getting a thousand yard. Yeah. I don't think the Bears have ever had a thousand yard receiver, have they, Ted? If they have, it's been few and far between, like Michigan <laughs> victories against Ohio State the last 20 years. DJ Moore is, yeah, he certainly can ruin a game. We saw him in that one Thursday night game against Washington to yeah. tear him apart. But yeah. the Vikings should have the advantage at receiver with or without JJ. If JJ's not 100%, I don't want him out there. Yeah, me either. You re injure that hamstring now, he's gone for the year. You're dealing with it for the rest of the season, and it's just a thing that's going to affect you as you go forward and, and make your final playoff push. So, yeah, I'd rather they sit him and make sure he's 100%, bring him back after the bye if that's what they feel is best. That's exactly what I would do. Yeah, I'm looking for Addison to have about eight or nine catches Monday night. I would hope so. All right, Drew, to the offensive line. I think the Bears have a pretty good offensive line, but the loss of Lucas Patrick at center is huge for them. That means Feeney's going to have to come in. He is half the center that Patrick is. That's a big loss for the Bears in the middle up front. I don't think he's going to play. I'd be surprised if Patrick was out there. I think they're going to hold him out. It's a back injury, Ted. You know, those things are tricky, mm -hmm. as we know with our boy Sullivan, Ted. Yeah. I have to give it to the Vikings. I mean, I, I wish they would have played better in Denver, but I think they got together as a group on the ride home and said, we cannot play like that against the team doesn't sack the quarterback a lot. They were getting to Dobbs too much. I like the Vikings on a home field, big bounce back game. I am giving them the big check mark, and I think they're going to open up some holes for the running game, and I think they're going to protect Dobbs. Vikings get my check mark. I'm giving it to the Vikings too. Ironically, I, I thought the interior line for the Vikings, the unit or the part of the offensive line that, that we have complained about collectively as a, as a fan base for years, played a lot better than Christian Derrissaw and Ryan O'Neal. Those guys, both guys seem to struggle on Sunday night. Uh, you, you look at the Bears front seven and, you know, you got Unique Ngakwe and, and Montez Sweat. You know, I don't think Ngakwe was, is the guy he was. Sweat they traded for at the deadline gave him a big, big extension. If Derrissaw and O'Neal are on their game, they, I think, are the best tackle tandem in the NFL. Uh, I'm just going to say that, right? Bears offensive line is, is not bad. Cody Whitehair, they drafted as a tackle they moved him to guard and, and he's kind of had a career renaissance at that position but all that said at home on Monday night in a raucous loud environment I'm gonna like I'm gonna take the Vikings offensive line here the front seven I think the Jordan Hicks absence was felt on yes. Sunday night Troy Dye I was seeing the recaps afterwards I think he only had one tackle Anthony Barr got in for a handful of plays I would expect the Vikings to really ramp up Anthony Barr and have him play a lot more than we saw on Sunday night, if he can come in and kind of fill the talent gap that we lost with, with Jordan Hicks going on IR, I think that will help stabilize the front seven. But losing Hicks, and I've, I'm kind of surprising I'm saying this because I thought he just was okay. Jordan Hicks has really blossomed in this Brian Flores defense, and, and the quicker he can get back, the better off this defense defensive unit will be. I talked about Ngakwe and, and Sweat earlier. T.J. Edwards and Tremaine Edmonds are guys. I don't think they've played as well as as advertised. Maybe maybe that's just me. But collectively, I like the Vikings front seven here better than the Bears. I gotta throw the challenge flag on that. Oh, okay. I think T.J. Edwards is having the best career <laughs> since he okay. was at Wisconsin. I mean, that okay. guy had a great game against the Lions last week. Couple pressures, led the team in tackle. As a matter of fact. He and Edmonds had like 17 tackles and eight pressures between them. They were going crazy against Goff. They were throwing Goff off. I think Andrew Billings is one of the best interior defensive linemen in the league. He's coming on really strong. We know about Ngakwe. He went to get ice, never came back. Sweat was a great pickup. And Justin Jones and whatever the other linebacker is. I gave a check mark because Hicks is gone, and we don't know what Roy can do yet. They're a little bit banged up up front. I think rushing yards are going to be hard to come by for both the Vikings and the Bears because the Vikings are seventh in the NFL in the run defense and the Bears are second. So I think either team is going to be really, it's really going to be a tough task to get any kind of chunk yards on the ground. But the Bears front seven, if you let them control the game at the line of scrimmage, the Vikings are going to have a tough time getting downfield. The Bears do not have a three and eight front seven. They don't. They, they're not the Eagles, but they're certainly not scrub of the league. Those guys are coming on and playing well, and I had to give them the check mark. I think they have a better front seven than we do. Okay, that's fair. What about the secondary? 
Secondary, I'm going Vikings, Ted. I like the Vikings secondary. I think they yeah. did enough to win the Denver game. Matter of fact, their secondary has done enough to win every game this year, maybe except the Eagles game. Okay. Yeah, I'd buy that. I think I'd buy that. They play great every week. It's just that we can't seem to get any play calls other than running it up the middle to protect our defense. Blackman's going to be a pro bowler in two years. You know how I feel about the safeties, Ted and Metellus. Yeah. Hey, pass off. Hats off. To Metellus, Michigan my guy, Michigan yeah. boy. He has had another great game. I like the Vikings secondary over the Bears, Ted. You can make a a point for uh, Kyler Gordon, Eddie Jackson, and Brisket being really good players. The Bears secondary is playing a lot better than it was the first month and a half of the season, though. But they're still susceptible to big plays. They are ranked, what, 26th? 26, yeah, 26th. In pass defense. If the Vikings are going to make any weight on the field, it's going to be throwing the football. Yeah. I don't think Kevin O'Connell is going to look at that because he likes to beat his head against the wall and run on first down up the middle. But uh, the Vikings get my check mark at corner this week, Ted, and I'm usually not giving them the giving them that much of a deal there. You know, you said that the Bears don't have a three and eight front seven. I would argue they do have a three and eight secondary because, like you said, they played very poorly the first half of the year. They're still very susceptible to giving up big plays. I don't think they're very good tackling, which which leads to those big plays, the big yards after catch. And I think that is where the Vikings are going to make their money on Monday night. If Dobbs can get on the same page as his receivers early, there there is a lot of passing yards on the field that the Vikings can get. I'm, I'm taking – and then you look at the Vikings secondary, like you said. You mentioned seventh in rushing yards. Who would have thought the Vikings defense would be top ten in anything heading into this year? It's amazing. And as good as the run defense has been, everybody thought the secondary was going to be a complete tire fire because – the guys they did have that were good last year, Patrick Peterson, gone. Duke Shelley, gone. In their place are guys that we didn't know anything about, and they're playing pretty doggone good. A Caleb Evans, although he's been injured. You mentioned Makai Blackman. Josh Metellus, your Michigan guy, hats off to me. He's, he's having a Pro Bowl year. I don't care what anybody says. And then you got Cam Bynum, who's had a career resurgence, and then the, the great should be future Hall of Famer in Harrison Smith. It's hard not to pick the Vikings here. I, I like that secondary a lot. Well said, Ted Glover. That's pretty well said. You better hope Ryan Day talk has enough well said in the locker room or you're going to get your tits licked Saturday. If you got to talk before this game to get people up to play that game, you've lost already. Get it up! <laughs> All right. Red zone. Vikings struggled in the red zone again. They, they had Josh Dobbs had that really awesome play. He avoided the rush and through that pass to, uh, but the Bears, they're fifth offensively, believe it or not, they're fifth offensively in red zone. But defensively, oh, they are terrible defensively. dead last. If you get in the red zone, if the Minnesota Vikings get in the red zone, and I think they will, and they don't convert touchdowns, they don't deserve to win this football game because the Bears give up touchdowns in the red zone like, like <laughs> who's already been paid. They just do. And the Vikings are like middle of the road, both offensively and defensively. I, so you average it out. I'm going to pick the Vikings red zone here just because the Bears red zone defense is just terrible. I think the Vikings got this is an area that they're worried about. They want to improve the red zone. They've been catching heat for it offensively, which they should. Yes. Because if you look at a lot of these losses, the Charger game, I can go on and on. You already know. All we have to do is convert in the red zone with a touchdown and we're Probably got nine wins on the year. Yeah, convert one of those field goals into a touchdown in just about every game, and I think the Vikings win just about every one of those games. Right. And I wish somebody would say that at the press conference so we could really talk about the issues. But I think it's an area of concern. The Bears are simply horrible down there in the red zone on defense. The first time we played, week six, if anybody's wondering, there was three combined red zone trips by both teams. Yeah, that was just a bad game all the way the around. The Vikings had were one for one in the red zone, which if you keep it score at home, that's perfect. And the Bears were one for two. There wasn't many met red zone trips between the two teams, but at least the Vikings got it done down there in the red zone. They have to get better in the red zone. This is gonna be a tight crunching game, Tad. They they gotta they gotta convert down there. You gotta stop running it up the middle on first down from the eighteen and getting nothing. Yeah. You got to quit wasting downs, and I think they have a lot to prove right here, and I think it's an area of concern for the coaches this week. I got the Vikings getting the check mark on the red zone. All right. What do you got for special teams? You know how I feel about uh, – Buzzkill, Greg Joseph? Buzzkill. I don't – you know. Santos is 19 of 20, Ted. 
Yep. You know what he is from 50 plus? What? Five for five. They have the better kicker. They have the better pressure kicker. But I'll give you this. I like the Vikings in terms of field position with Wright. He's twice the kicker that, twice the punter that the Bears got, Gil. But okay. each punt returner, each punt return team averages 7.9 a punt return. They're about the same. They're not going to kill you in the punt game. And did you know our boy Powell has had 23 punt return attempts, only one fair catch? And you know how I feel about Keenan Howery, fair catching everything. I yep. can't stand it. I can't stand the fair catch if you got room to run. And Powell proves by only having one fair catch that he likes to get in there and make amends of it, you know? So I think uh, I gave the Vikings a check mark here, but I hope it doesn't come down to a kick because I really don't have any more faith in Joseph. I don't know how you feel about him. I don't either. And the one thing you, you talk about Brandon Paul, the one thing I really like about him besides that he doesn't fair catch is when he catches the ball, he goes north and south. He goes yes! north field. He, he doesn't. He doesn't try and get to the edge, and and which almost never works on a punt return if you have a good coverage team. He he looks upfield and finds where there might be a seam or a gap, and he goes and he gets yeah eight or ten. And it, I'm telling you, that approach is gonna is gonna cause him to break one, and it's gonna happen really soon. I thought more than once the last couple of weeks he had he breaks one more tackle, and and it's it's either a huge gain well into the red zone of the other team, or or if not a touchdown. Like your old friend Woody Hayes used to say to his punt returners, I don't want you dancing around. <laughs> if I wanted somebody to dance around back there, I'd go get one of those cheerleaders. I want you to run down the field. Woody Hayes. Oh, Woody. Man. I met him once. Did I tell you that? Yeah, the Clemson guy met him too. Stop it. Right cross. Stop it. No, I like it too. Get the ball and go upfield. Don't dance around. I'm giving it to the Bears just because you, you really? talked about Cairo Santos. Yeah, I mean, everything else is fairly equal. So it if it comes down to a kick, who do you trust, Santos or, or Greg Joseph? Between extra points and field goals, that Santos guy's only missed two kicks the whole season. Yeah, and Buzzkill, as you like to call him, has missed two extra points and five field goals. He's one of the worst. <laughs> I think he's the worst field goal kicker in the NFL percentage-wise, or he's near the bottom. He's only 17 to 22. Do you feel confident when he enters the game? 40 yards and under, yeah, I do. Anything over 40 yards and it's crapshoot, man. And I, I could understand maybe from 50, but between 40 and 49, that's that's why you are an NFL kicker, to make those consistently. I, I, I don't know. No, I'm Santos, not. five for five from 50 plus. I mean, that's yeah. money. You want to be money as a kicker. Well, here's another thing. Why don't you get touchdowns? You want it to settle for it. Stop playing for field goals. Good point. What do you got for coaching, Ted? But, you know, you wanted to talk about this first. I think there's a question you wanted to ask me, so I'll let you I'll let you take this one, and then I'll do intangibles. I wanted to ask you, does our head coach, does he coach from a strategy of trying to hold the lead, keep a lead by holding it, or is he a head coach that likes to build on the lead? Because there's a difference there. We've seen a lot of coaching over the years from a lot of, a lot of coaches, and a lot of coaches feel if I'm 20 points ahead, it's just like it's 0-0. Zero, zero. I'm going to attack. Attack, attack. What is our coach's strategy to winning? Because it seems to me over the last couple of seasons, when he gets up seven or 10 points, he doesn't coach to build on it. So you tell me. I would argue that that game in Denver was Kevin O'Connell's most poorly coached game as the head coach of the Vikings. There was a sequence of plays and it was, it was first down. The Vikings were driving, pretty sure they were in the red zone. And he, he ran the ball, I think, twice with Alexander Madison for no gain. And it just pretty much shot whatever chance they had to score a touchdown. The Vikings had the lead at the time, and I think he was trying to milk the clock. I think he is a very good play caller, and I, I think he is aggressive. I also believe that when they get to that point, for whatever reason, they have trouble executing. And I don't know why that is. They're tired. It's later in the game. They're not running their first 15 or 20 scripted plays. I, I don't know what the deal is. But at some point, there's there's a transition between the offense being fairly well executed and everybody seems to be on the same page, and they just kind of are off a beat or two between the play calling and the execution or, or whatever. I, I don't know what it is. I see why you think that. I do. He did coach that way against Denver. I do believe that. And I don't know if it was because, you know, he had Josh Dobbs, he didn't have Kirk, and he didn't want, you know, he'd already, Dobbs had already thrown an interception and had a couple of fumbles. And he was leery about that. I don't, I don't know what his reasoning was there. But, yes, I think he did coach that way 
against the Broncos, and I'll talk about this in my intangibles, but I, I just think, you know, the Vikings playing with house money. Just let it all hang out, man. Just go for it. No real reason to lose that game, and I agree with you. It was all on the play calling, and I know realistic Randy feels the same way if you've seen his video this week. Yeah. I have a rule, and a lot of it comes from watching a lot of college football the last 50 years. I have what's called the five-score, eight-minute rule. If you're up by five scores minimum and there's eight minutes or less, you could run the ball all you want. I don't give a F about it. Yeah. Run it, run it, run it. I like being up 35 to nothing in play action passing. That's just me. I love seeing Michigan do it. They're going to do it Saturday because they're going to be up by a lot. That's aggressive. Yeah. That's aggressive play calling. Not going for a tight end slant pattern on first down from your own 30-yard line. I think Kevin O'Connell is a really good head coach. I think we'll be better off with a better play caller. I think he leaves a lot out on the table with the talent he has as a play caller. Look at that Saints game, 27-3. to How'd that end up? Yeah, another nail biter. A better example would be, look at the team coming in Monday night into our house. Look what happened last year. We were up 20 to nothing on the Bears at halftime or something close to that, Ted. 20 yeah. to 3 or something. We started coaching not to build on the lead, but to protect the lead. And they ended up taking the lead. I think they were up 22 to 20 in that game. I think, yeah, I think 22 to 21. I think you're right. So I can apply the example to the game that's coming up Monday night. You blew a lead against them. like You shouldn't blow leads like that. You shouldn't. I agree. I think it's a trend and a pattern with KOC. You know, I worked, I worked for somebody once in construction, and he always did everything the long way, the drawn out way, the harder way. I was a foreman on his in his company. He was the owner. And I said, I'm going to start doing things my way because your way is the long way. And he told me, if I do it the hard way, I feel like I accomplish more. Some people are like that. Yeah. Some people feel, I mean, coaches feel if we can win by three, I feel like I'm a better coach if I win by 30. I don't like the way he coaches with leads. And he has to learn how to start building on it or he's going to be looking for a job. I'd like yeah. to get a different play caller in here next season. You got... 15-yard pass to Hawkinson. Then you got a 21-yard pass to Addison. You're moving down the field. You get it to the 17, and you run it up the middle twice. What in the hell is going through your mind? You don't have Derrick Henry. You know, you don't have Adrian Peterson. You got a, yeah. you got Madison. It's not the same thing, Ted. It's not. Madison is not a starting caliber running back, I don't think. If we had better play calling from the red zone in, we'd have lost like one or two games this year. I think you're right. And you got to start picking it up doing something different so that's my rant let's move on all right i'm giving the vikings the, the... <laughs> <laughs> you spent the last 10 minutes saying kevin o'connell sucks as a play caller i'm picking the vikings you know, you know what and I, I, people people get, are getting upset with me i like him as a head coach he and west phillips come up with a good plan i think they look at tape which zimmer didn't and i think they try to get the mismatches they try to play per team they're playing Except he's too damn conservative. He's too scared down there. Let it go, man. Let it yeah. rip. But I am giving him because Eberflu sucks. He's terrible. He is, yeah. He's one of the worst head coaches in football. I'd be surprised if he was there another year. I like their staff better. Matt Daniels is a great coordinator. We know what Flores can do. If they would just pick up the offensive play calling, how do you have the balls to call a fake punt in your own territory, but you don't have the balls to go air when you get in the red zone? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, the legit questions. All right. Intangibles. For me, I you know, it, this kind of goes into what you were just talking about, O'Connell. The, the Vikings, as, as soon as Kirk Cousins got hurt and was out for the year, the Vikings were playing with house money, I feel. No matter what they did, right? nobody expected them to win more than probably two or three more games for the rest of the year. So why not just let it all hang out? Quasio Dolphomens made that absolute heist for Josh Dobbs at the trade deadline. Dobbs has played well. And like you said, you know, why not just go out there and be aggressive every single series? Because you've got nothing to lose. Nobody expected you to be six and five and in the in the hunt for the playoffs at this point in the season. Nobody expected you to still even remote as it is within shouting distance of the division. Sure. So so just adopt that mentality and go play that way. And good things are gonna happen. Because they did, they did against Atlanta and it worked. They did against New Orleans for, what, two and a half quarters, and it worked. They didn't against Denver, and it didn't work. So just have that aggressive mentality. And to do that, they just have to have some sustained drives. And when they get in the red zone, convert. Justin Fields, I think, can be dangerous. 
I thought the Vikings did a pretty good job containing him up until the point he was hurt in their first meeting. And a lot of that had to do with Jordan Hicks. That was Jordan Hicks' career game. I think he had a, a fumble recovery return for a touchdown. He had a couple of picks. I mean, he had a heck of a game, and and Jordan Hicks is out. So there's going to be added pressure on the defense, I, I think. And so the offense is just going to have to just hold on to the ball, score points, and do your thing. And the other intangible is that I will be at that game with my grandson. I'm taking him to his first Vikings game. So that is... Better be incentive enough for the Vikings to win. So those are my intangibles. My only intangible is Grayson being at the game. That's the only intangible I got. We're not going to lose because if he's going to his first Viking game, we will not lose that game. I hope not. All right, so we'll put the board up for summary. You know, I kind of set up my intangibles. The the Vikings offense just needs to control the tempo of the game. And if they do that, they're going to win. The one thing we said that would derail the Vikings in Denver was turnovers, and that's exactly what happened. You, Madison had that fumble on their way, and they were getting ready to score, I think. God, that was a killer. That was a killer. Even if they get a field goal there, they win that game. Dobbs had that interception, I think, on the other side. It was on the uh, Denver side of the 50. He also had a couple more fumbles. I don't think he lost them, or he lost the one fumble early that should have been a, a stinking personal foul penalty. And then he had the one later in the game that was a first down and just was a wasted down. You cannot have plays like that, man. You've got to play clean football. I believe the Vikings are a better football team. And if they play clean football, they'll win. Pretty much what I got. These are two teams that have a they have a self-destruct implode button. They make they big mistakes at big time. When, last week, they had the Lions beat and they imploded. Oh, the geez. Bears had them beat and they found a way to lose. Very similar to the Vikings against Denver, the Vikings the first month. But I do feel that the offense is going to be going to thrive more with Dobbs than Cousins. I do. The first time they played in week six, you remember the 1913 victory? Mm-hmm. Vikings only had 220 yards and 12 first downs in that game. Wow. And they managed to get a win. And that's when the Bears defense was like the about as bad as they have been this whole right. year. Right. They're not that same defense now. So you're going to have to play better. You're not going to be able to sneak out a victory. A lot of Dobbs movement back there and making plays happen. I like the offense better against the Bears with Dobbs than I do with Cousins. And that's not a knock on Cousins. I think Cousins is a better overall quarterback, but you got to look at who you're playing. The Bears have a really strong front seven, but they're weak in the secondary. Mm -hmm. And we have the receivers that can exploit the secondary. Now, if we start running in the middle for minus one and getting a second and 11, we're going to be in trouble all day, which we've been doing all season. That's what we do all season. So... The first time they played, they they beat the Bears with great pass defense. The Vikings' pass defense was great that day. Mm-hmm. And they won the turnover battle, Ted, 3-1. to one. Yep. This is really, we talk about who wins the turnover battle, wins the game. These two teams, whoever wins the turnover battle is going to win the game. They're both minus six in turnover margin. Both tied for 26 in the NFL in turnover margin. So, yeah, whoever wins the turnover margin, if it, unless they break even at four turnovers each, this, you're right, is going to win this football game. This is going to be a hard-fought game. And we're, I'm anxious to see if we can get back on track. But Vikings won't lose this game because Grayson's going to be there. You could take that to the bank. I hope so. I still remember the first time I walked out of the concourse to see you Met see Stadium. the field. You know, you got the Vikings painted in the end zone. You, they had the the Viking. The, well, at the time, it was the, the purple V on the 50 at the old Met Stadium. Remember that? Right. And you're like, wow, this is just cool. I got to see it with his first Cardinals game. All three of the boys. I, I cannot wait. I cannot wait. All right. So that's that's our uh, preview for this week's Bears game. We're not doing trivia tonight because it's the week of the greatest rivalry in all of sport. We got to talk about the game, brother. Let's do it real quick. What are your keys to victory for Ohio State and Michigan on Saturday? Keys to Michigan's victory? Ryan Day is worried about the run. Two years ago, he gave up 300 yards on the ground. Last year, he gave up 252. 552 yards rushing in two games. He does not want to get run on. So I think Ohio State's going to be ready for the run. Michigan's running game is not what it was last year. How you beat Michigan is you force the pass. You don't give him any rushing yards. Force the pass and try to get a pass rush on McCarthy. But Michigan's key to victory is, especially on defense, if you throw deep on Michigan, you're going to, like Maryland did, you're going to be able to find their weak spot. Yep. Uh, but nobody's done it all year except Maryland. So I'm, I don't know. McCord's in for a world of shit. If Michigan starts getting pressure from their front seven, they have the best front seven in football. They have a great defense. They only allow under 10 points a game. But Michigan, when they play Ohio State, they seem to pull out the uh, the passing game a little more. 
I think if Ohio State could run the football, runs for 150, I think they're going to win the game. Ohio State can't turn it over because Michigan's defense is momentum. They've had like five pick sixes. They've had punt returns for touchdowns. Their defense and being at home, that's the keys to victory for Michigan. Here's the thing. Kyle McCord, I, th- I think this game rests a lot on Kyle McCord's shoulders. We kind of talk every Saturday about, you know, our teams. I- I'm not a big Kyle McCord guy yet. Although I will say, when it was time to step up and play big boy football, he has done that. He he had that that monster drive at Notre Dame on the road, hostile environment, and and the Penn State game. I agree with you, and and I will say it it feels like the Buckeyes are peaking, and Michigan has kind of struggled a little bit. They played good enough to beat Penn State on the road, and that's that's a tough environment to play. But they didn't throw a pass. They ran their last 35 offensive plays were runs because they didn't trust J.J. McCarthy. Last week, McCarthy didn't look great against Maryland. That was his worst game last week. And so if Michigan is one-dimensional like that and McCarthy is limited and Ohio State, and it's a big if, if Ohio State can, I don't want to say stop Blake Corm because Blake Corm is going to get his, but neutralize him, prevent him and Donovan Edwards from popping off for 55, 60, 70-yard runs like they did. I think Ohio State's only given up one or two plays greater than 40 yards all year. Their defense is a lot more fundamentally sound than it's been. I don't see them giving up 40-plus points again. Other than McCord, I will give you two names. And Marvin Harrison Jr., he's obviously a big guy, but he's not one of them. I I think he's going to get his like Blake Horm is. Two guys, Travion Henderson and Cade Stover. I think if Cade Stover can exploit the middle and get yards upfield and Travion Henderson can run the ball and keep Ohio State in second and four, and third and two, and ahead of schedule, as we like to say, Ohio State has a very good chance to win this football game. I think they do, too, and those are the two players I got on my worry list besides Harrison. Now I'm going to give you three. Mason Graham, our defensive tackle, who is going to be the next J.J. Watt. He's only a like freshman or a sophomore. That guy is all over the place. Big, big disruptor in the middle with Chris Jenkins. The middle of the defensive line is very good. And Loveland, our tight end slash wide receiver, number 18. He is a weapon, and I don't think a lot of people look out for him. McCarthy has struggled, but he never struggles at home. He comes alive at home. I am looking forward to a fantastic game. I think it's going to be close down the mark because I think Ohio State's ready for this game. And like you said, they seem like two teams going in different directions right now. Yeah. Ryan Day has to be aggressive. He has to stay aggressive. You know, we talked about aggressiveness in coaching. He's got to stay aggressive this entire game. He's on the road. He's got to take the crowd out of it early, and he cannot coach not to lose because I think that's what he did last year. Ohio State had the lead, I think, at halftime and then well into the third quarter or into the third quarter or maybe whatever. Michigan scored. He just went all John Cooper. He turtled up and got all super conservative, and and it just it, it just snowballed from there, man. Yeah, Day's going to have to be on it. He did turtle last year, and – uh it's going to be cold. I don't know if it's going to be snowing, but it's going to be cold. Damn, Ted, I am. <laughs> this is going to be a great game. This is a game of the year, baby. Yeah, and it's our yeah. teams are in it. Ryan Day, if he loses this game, he's he's lost three straight. I don't think an Ohio State coach has done that in, well, since John Cooper. Uh, I mean, there's going to be a lot of grumbling in Columbus. Don't care what you say about his results. You, you come to Ohio State to beat Michigan. If he loses to Michigan for a third straight time, he's going to be on the hot seat. We'll see what happens. We'll That's see right. what happens. I'm looking forward happens. to it, that, and I'm looking forward to a, the big Vikings game Monday night. We won't have a post-game show, though, will we? No post-game show. We tried that week one when I was in Minneapolis. Didn't it didn't work. didn't work out well. So, But we'll be back. We'll be back soon. So, have you been on a lot of blind dates? Um, well, this would make one. Oh, (laughs) me too. What do you do? I'm a vet. I love animals. Really? Yeah. Where are you from? Michigan. Born and raised. Go blue!
five, just short of the end zone. And Ohio State takes over. There is Garvey Cross. It is not a cut. It is. It is Garvey Cross. The next time Ohio State got the ball, its reserves got a chance to impress. Ray Gillian almost goes all the way. Gillian sprints 50 yards. Rover on the blitz. He's open. Pulisar. He'll go the distance. They won't catch it. Ohio State's lead, 7-3. There he goes. So long. Cattle in motion near side. Hand off to the Akbadunga straight ahead. Touchdown! Collins. Got it. Intercepted! Buckeyes! Here's the run again. Got him at Edwards. Whoa! Can they catch him? No! Got him at Edwards again! I'm cooler than you are. Why don't you fix your little problems and light this candle? He's right. Let's light this candle. He surely is. Light the candle. Yes. Resume the countdown.